Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh and a very good morning. A warm welcome to all participants from Malaysia, the Simio Network and affiliated countries to today's webinar. Okay, the, the, team, the team today is uh, Dengue in Malaysia, an endemic amidst COVID-19 pandemic. Actually, COVID has taught us a lot of lessons. COVID-19 is an infectious disease, as all of you all know, and has great distractions in our lives. By the way, it has also created quality times for us where you can always stay at home, work from home with your loved ones. Our presenters today are from the Institute for Medical Research, Malaysia. I'm Nazdi Wasi Ahmad from Medical Entomology Unit, Infectious Disease Research Center, IMR, and will be your moderator for today's session. Ladies and gentlemen, this webinar series was initiated with the aim in mind to share the latest research findings in dengue research as in other diseases such as COVID, novel ideas is urgently needed to combat the diseases and not doing the same thing over and over again, but expecting different results. As what Albert Einstein says, because this will not lead you to nowhere. This webinar is conducted in conjunction with the ASEAN Dengue Day, which is normally on 15 June every year. The World Health Organization has acknowledged the growing prominence of dengue infections across the globe in the past decades. There are also initiatives to WHO to designate a World Dengue Day. Hope it will be a reality soon. You know, there is a Mosquito Day, there is a uh, Nurses' Day, there is a Father's Day, there is a Mother's Day, but I haven't heard of Researchers' Day or a Scientist's Day. Actually, they are really working very hard at the back of the screen. I think the WHO should also uh, acknowledge these researchers. Perhaps there is a day, maybe I do not know, but you know we need to have such days to give these researchers more uh, a meaning to them. Before we begin our presentation, allow me to announce a few housekeeping messages. Please listen carefully. One, we will not be taking questions during the presentation, but participants may ask questions using the link that we have shared in the email and YouTube channel. Two, a question and answer session will be con uh, conducted after the end of the presentation. Three, an attendance list link is also provided to those who would like to receive an e-certificate of attendance. It is available at the YouTube description section. Ladies and gentlemen, for today's webinar, we have two prominent speakers. Our speaker is Dr. Muhammad Rizwan Muhammad Abdul Razak, a researcher from Bioassay Unit, Herbal Medicine Research Center, IMR. He holds a doctoral degree in Structural and Molecular Biology from the University College London. His recent research interest is on drug discovery for dengue, and of course, he will not miss the drugs discovery for anti-SARS-CoV-2. He has published 20 papers in international peer-reviewed journals. For today, Dr. Rizwan will be sharing his research experience entitled Dengue Drug Discovery and Challenges. Dr. Rizwan, the screen is yours. Assalamualaikum and very good morning to, all, to everyone. And thank you to Dr. Nazni for your kind introductions. And also thank you to organizing committee for inviting me to share about the current dengue drug discovery and also the challenges that has been faced by many scientists around the world. So this is um, some introductions about dengue. WHO has estimated that 3.9 billion are at risk 
and the 70% of actual burden is in Asia. It's, it is a disease caused by dengue virus infections, and it can be transmitted from human to human by Indus mosquito. There are four serotypes of dengue, dengue virus one, two, three, and four. Those who, who get infected with dengue virus will develop a dengue fever symptom from the mild symptom to a severe dengue. In Malaysia, we still rely on vector control and surveillance as, the, as dengue prevention strategies. But what about dengue treatment? Until now, there are no such specific drugs to treat dengue patients. And we have vaccine called dengue vaccia. However, the usage of this vaccine is only limited for those who have been infected with dengue virus. And currently, we still rely on dengue patient management. Those patients who has been diagnosed uh, in, for severe dengue will be closely monitored in the hospital for fluid management. This fluid management is to maintain the intravascular volume and maintain the cardiovascular stability. Understanding on dengue pathogenesis is very important in order to find a correct and important target to actually attack the dengue virus. Okay, from here we can see that the progress of severe dengue, the, the development of severe dengue is actually contributed by several factors, the viral factors and host factors. We can see that for, for in terms of viral factors, dengue virus NS1 has been reported to have some disruption on the macrophage signaling, hence it activates the macrophage. This will actually um, cause some dysregulation of our immune response. What about dengue virus genome? Uh, there are study has confirmed that a different serotype of dengue virus will actually uh, give us different severity in dengue. And especially the serotype 2, it has been confirmed that this type will actually um, have uh, enhancement in their virus replication hence also cause some disruptions in our immune response. What about the host factors? The host factors, for example, ADE, or, is, or we call it antibody-dependent enhancement, has been shown that the secondary infection by different serotypes could cause a confusion in the antibody productions, and hence it will also cause the viral replication enhancement. And it's also from the host factors, they have found that the anti ns one antibodies which has been developed from, by our body is have the alpha antibodies activity as well. And there's also some reports showing that there are T cells that can actually defective to our immune response. And all this, we can say that uh, viral factors and host factors is the cause uh, uh, for the uh, development of uh, severe dengue, uh, such as uh, plasma leakage, coagulopathy, and thrombocytopenia. So from the, from the mechanism of dengue pathogenesis, we can actually um, divide the potential dengue drug targets into two. First is to target the varimia, and second is to target the symptom. For varimia, many of uh, studies have reported that uh, almost of the compounds uh, have the antiviral activity towards the virus entry and viral replications. And then this group of compounds will normally targeting the essential protein that has been used uh, by the virus to actually replicate itself in our host in the, in the body. And there are also some reports that um, the, the indirect target for the virus replications is also uh, can be in the host target as well. Okay, what about the symptoms? There's not much reports on uh, dengue on uh, dengue treatments regarding the um, to treat the uh, plasma to treat the symptom of dengue virus. From here, we can see that uh, there is a potential that um, those a uh, group of compounds or substances that have um, anti they have an immunomodulatory activities such as antiflimity, 
activities have the potential to actually reduce the pro-inflammatory cytokines, which is uh, the cause of the plasma leakage. So in this group of compounds, the target molecules will be the inflammatory cytokines or the enzyme involved in the pro-inflammation. This is one of the example study conducted by our group, uh, looking at the immunomodulatory activities of the plant extracts called carica papillae juice. Okay, this study is conducted in a um, tangy mouse model, which, is, which we have developed. So, the treatment, we treat the, we, uh, the, the mouse model is, uh, we establish the mouse model by dengue virus inoculation. And 24 hours after the virus inoculation, we start to do the treatment with the free stride carica leaf juice. And on day four post infection, we start to collect the samples to analyze the platelet leukocyte counts, viral RNA counts, cytokine screening, and dengue and the gene expression analysis. To simplify the findings, we found that carica papillitis is not an antiviral for dengue. However, it reduced the pro-inflammatory cytokine production in the dengue virus infected mice, particularly the interleukin-6 and tinea Both of these cytokines has been shown to be associated with the severe dengue in patients. So this is one of the example of studies. And then uh, uh, to show that the potential of the substance with the immunomodulatory to be used to treat dengue or is, it can also be used as an injunctive therapy in dengue. So for drug discovery process, here is a very simple um, schematic schematic uh, diagram about the discovery process. Um, start with the heat discovery process, heat discovery and preclinical and of course clinical trials. Most of the most of the uh, report has shown that a uh, lot of heat has been um, found in the in the early drug discovery phase. Here we can see that if you compare the number of, of uh, reported anti dengue dates, we can see that a lot of a lot of uh, articles has been found to actually uh, reporting the um, in vitro studies and cell based screening. screening. And then, of course, those the potent uh, uh, compound can actually be uh, evaluated in clinical in vivo study. And of course, once they have uh, uh, evaluated by in vivo study, the compound can be used in human trials. We can see that the high, uh, the, 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 the number of um, reported anti dengue candidates actually uh, reducing because this is because of the screening, the, uh, the number of screen that they have done, particularly once, especially in clinical in vivo study. Here, where we use uh, most of the study, we will use mouse as a dengue mouse model. And they showed that um, um, from here, they some of the um, um, uh, compounds will actually um, not perform well in the animal model, maybe because of the bioavailability problems and also the efficacy problems as well. So it means that uh, once you have a uh, uh, found a potent anti dengue activity of a compounds in vitro, it may not actually uh, translate into the in vivo complex model. So, in dengue drug, dis uh, in, in dengue drug discovery studies, uh, there are two actually ways. First is to study the new compounds. So, studying the new compounds uh, will lead uh, to a lengthy traditional drug discovery buffet. This is because we need to actually collect the efficacy data, safety data, pharmacokinetic data, and of course, we need to actually uh, think about the formulations. After all this, it's not granted for approval, and it's, it's going to be a cost, not so cost effective. And the current strategies is to use the repurposing drugs. Yeah. This is uh, some kind of fast lane for drug discovery. 
the good thing about repurposing drug is that um, the data is already there, the safety data, the availability of pharmacology data, and the drug is already in the formula to form. So we only need a new efficacy data to actually um, uh, justify the use of these drugs on the Stengi antiviral. Since this, this is the list of um, example of repurposed drug that has been reported to have anti-dengue in vitro and this is another one another list showing the assisted value the potential assisted value of dengue virus so all this need uh, the, poten the potential of this need to be evaluated in vivo and also in clinical trials as well What about clinical studies? There are limited clinical studies that have been reported uh, in in dengue in, in to study dengue. Yeah, first um, the one that is latest one is the evermectin. This one has is conducted in Thailand, and it shows that um, it gives a shorter NS1 antigen clearance time but there's no change in the viremia. And there are also other drugs that has been, uh, uh, has been tested in clinically, such as chloroquine, sergocivir, balapiravir. And then all of these drugs fail to actually uh, meet the primary endpoint of the clinical studies, especially in reducing the viremia. Okay, this is another two drugs, which is not really specific towards antiviral activity. And this is other anti-inflammatory uh, drugs. And also, this drug also shows not to be effective clinically. So from all of these clinical studies, uh, they have come up with the several clinical trial issues. There are three of them. One is the incorrect timing of treatment. So this, the solution is to actually treat the patient at earlier point of fever onset, it, particularly to those drugs that have, uh, that targeting the uh, viral replication. So the challenges is most of the patients admitted to the hospital is at late viral stage. So there is quite impossible to actually uh, uh, group the patients which one is the one have the uh, early point of fever and the one is uh, late uh, with the late fever. So this is because treatment at this point has no beneficial effect, especially for drugs targeting virus application processes. And then it's been shown by uh, animal model as well. Second is the insufficient dosage. Uh, this is a common issues. This is one of the common issues that is reported by some of the clinical studies. So the, the doses used for the other disease might not be efficient in dengue diseases, especially those with the anti-hepatitis uh, C virus. Uh, to, um, for sure, pharmacokinetic study need to be uh, done and to support the use of, of improved dosages. Last but not least is the not supported by enough clinical data. And uh, there are some clinical studies um, they are not supported by enough in vitro and animal model studies, especially against all serotype of dengue. So this is one of, of example is a postmortem done by the groups in Singapore after their first clinical trial on, on the use of sergocible. And they done this in the animal mouse model what they found is that the efficacy of sergocivir differs among different cell lines and viral strains. Se second is the sergocivir is beneficial against clinical dengue virus when treatment is started at the time of infection in mice, which is the early time of virus infections. Antiviral effect on controlling viremia become less prominent once viremia reach the peak level in mice. 
Increased dosing of cyclosulfur achieve a significant lower viral load, even when the mice are very big. So this shows how important it is um, to study the therapeutic window of the, each of the, of the, of the uh, candidates, and also to see uh, the effect of different dosage on the um, varimia. So as a summary, we know that there were many potential, sorry, there were many potential dengue antiviral compounds reported at early drug discovery stage. A continuous effort in searching for new dengue drug treatment is in need to fill in drug discovery pipeline of dengue for dengue. The complexity of the complexity of dengue pathogenesis has contributed to the difficulty in searching for dengue antiviral and combination treatment. Combi for example, uh, combining the antiviral and anti-inflammatory agents might be a promising initiative in dengue drug discovery. Additional parameters need to be tested preclinically, example, traffic window and the efficacy against all four types, dengue virus serotypes is in need. This will be my last slides and thank you for your attention. Dr. Nazir, the floor is yours. Thank you, Dr. Rizwan, for returning me the floor. Thanks for the great and interesting talk. If there's any question that you would like to ask about Dr. Rizwan's presentation, kindly fill up the form using the link given in the YouTube descrip description section. Next, I would like to introduce our second speaker, Dr. Nurul Husna Abdul Hamid. She obtained her PhD in 2011 from University of Malaysia, Pahang. Her research interest is developing promising tools for eyeball viral disease control. So it is our great privilege to have Dr. Husna with us to share her experience in conducting randomized control trial, in short RCT, for dengue incidents using uh, uh, using uh, ORS, outdoor residual spray, in combination with auto dissemination traps in Malaysia. The floor is yours, Dr. Husna. Thank you very much, Dr. Nazni, for your kind introductions. Uh, good morning. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh to all the participants of IMR CIMA webinar series 2021. So my name is Nurul Husna Abdul Hamid, or you can call me Husna. I'm a research officer in Medical Entomology Unit, IMR. So um, for today, I'm going to share with all of you my experience working with the randomized control trial for uh, vector control. And then uh, my presentation entitled IDEM, the insightful twist in the dengue vector control during the COVID-19 pandemic. Okay, so all of you must be wondering why what is EDEM. So EDEM is actually a randomized control trial, okay, for uh, to check to to evaluate the effectiveness of IVM in the incidence of dengue in urban Malaysia. So EDEM is actually acronyms for intervention for dengue epidemiology in Malaysia. Now um, this is a, a collaborative project under public private partnership, and then we are um, we. We, 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 all of us, I mean, that all the collaborators, we call us ourselves as a consortium. So this is our partners and our collaborators. Okay, the objective of EDEM is actually to quantify the effectiveness of proactive IVM approach on the incidence of the dengue in Federal ter Territory Kuala Lumpur and Putrajaya. And the second one is to evaluate the effectiveness of the IVM approach on the population density of mosquitoes and insecticide resistant. For your information, we conducted a pilot study in Johor Bahru. Uh, in 2017 and 2019, but because of we don't have enough sample size, so we have to move it here to Kuala Lumpur and Putrajaya. So why Malaysia? Why Malaysia? Because of um, it is endemic for dengue, and uh, we have a solid dengue surveillance infrastructures, and we have a good support from the Ministry of Health to set up this these kinds of trial. Uh, 
This video shows a total of 280 localities, 140 40 localities for the control arm, another 140 localities uh, intervention arm in federal territory of Kuala Lumpur and Putrajaya. So uh, this uh, study site uh, consists of five districts from Titiwangsa, Kepong, Cheras, Lembah Pantai and Putrajaya and we randomized these uh, localities from 870 localities that has uh, dengue cases, more than 50 dengue cases in year 2019 to, uh, sorry, 2018-2019. So we have these uh, 280 localities and then we are targeting uh, a low and a medium cost res uh, high rise residents. So this is a few pictures of the uh, the residents. Okay, um, this is um, a brief um, methodology on what we are doing here in Malaysia for the EDEM. So uh, both control and intervention will receive the vector control activities as uh, MOH SOPs. So if there is a case, they will have a space spray, lab siding, and source reduction, whatever the activities that we have. But for the intervention side, on the top of it, we will have the preventive action, which is the ORS and also auto dissemination device. So this one is um, uh, uh, added into the localities. And then from out of 140, we are totally observed their EPID uh, cases. And then only 12 localities from the control and 12 localities from the intervention will be used for EPID and end-to-end points totally. So it means that we will have 24 localities that will be observed on epidemiology and entomology. So for the entomological parts, we will observe the monitorings, uh, of trap monitorings. We have a larval identification. We do the, we did, we do the lava survey, adult monitoring, and also observations of the resistance monitoring in the um, side area. Now, uh, IDEM actually consists of uh, four pillars or four components we call it. So the first one is community engagement. The second one is the vector control activities. Uh, the third one is entomological endpoint and the last one will be the epidemiological endpoints. So this is a few pictures of community engagement before the pandemic hits us. We start our community engagement in December 2019 and uh, uh, in February, we have to stop it. Uh, sorry, in March, we have to stop it because of we uh, Malaysia has the uh, the first phase of MCO. So this is a few pictures, right? So for the vector control activities, we have two, as I mentioned, outdoor residual spray and also auto dissemination, auto -dissemination device. Outdoor residual spray is actually a, a modifications of indoor residual spray. But why I put it is outdoor because of we sprayed it actually out out of the units, not inside the units. So we are using the same insecticide as IRS. So we are targeting the area like, uh, for example, like a corridors and a dam and dark corners where uh, it is mosquito might be recited. So for the EDDs, it is actually a dual function mosquito traps. It's containing pariproxifone and Bruvaria basiana an insect specific fungus, which can uh, stun the growth of the larvae and uh, uh, kill the adult mosquitoes. Okay, this is a video of how we conducted the outdoor residual spray. Okay. And then this is how we uh, do the ADD installations and monitoring. Okay, uh, now this is um, uh, a pictures of entomological activities. We are doing the ovitraps, uh, setting up uh, 
novel identification and also we also uh, did some resistance and uh, and uh, uh, resistant test on the field collected mosquitoes so uh, for the epid endpoints we um, uh, extract the data out from the uh, national database which is there which is called as e dengue so um, for this one, I would like to share the preliminary observation. This is not finalized yet because of the study is still ongoing. So uh, the results actually were obtained from 46 localities, which is a 23 from the control arm, another 23 from the uh, intervention arm. So uh, these uh, localities is actually already completed three ORS cycle, which is one cycle uh, for a month and five ADD servicing. Each servicing is a uh, two full um, month. So the first cycle was in April 2020, and then the last one was in December 2020. Uh, for the coverage time, uh, I can say that it's uh, supposedly it's supposed from May 2020 until April 2021. Uh, then, uh, like uh, for the epi and entomological data, uh, we are collecting from six localities, three from the control arm and another three from the intervention arm. Okay. Uh, for the ORS coverage in all intervention localities, about 78% to 100% auto walls were sprayed with the insecticide. Uh, ideally, for the ORS method, uh, the coverage area should be more than 80% based on the previous study uh, to have a minimum impact to, in killing the infected mosquito. However, for since the EDEM are using a combination of two ORS and ADD, so the first percentage of the coverage uh, 70, uh, equals 70 or more than 70% is acceptable. Now, um, this graph is actually um the uh the the it shows that what happened to the ADD that we deploy in the site so uh 70% of the ADD that we monitored uh for five servicings shows that there is a presence of larvae but uh, less than 50 larvae per trap so we are actually monitoring uh less than 50 larvae or more than 50 larvae and then the, the ADD without any larvae so for the time being we see that uh we have the larvae and that it's less than 50. uh we also find out that we have less than four percent of missing ADD in the field uh about nine eight percent of the damaged ADD and about uh, 22 percent of the ADD considered dry there is no water so this is a quite worrying because of for me uh, mosquito traps without is water is actually uh, not function at all so i would i would i would share with you what happened to this one actually we have the plan uh, for the dry ADD all right so um uh, for the ovi traps index we find out that it is uh inconsistent as observed in the previous ORS study okay um sorry this is some technical some technical uh um disturbance all right uh let me let me explain to you this one uh for the ov traps index uh based on the previous study that is inconsistent in ov traps index so it is happens few times actually so we also seen the same thing in this one i'm hoping that we will have a very good um um ov traps index once the the, the study is completed okay uh for and then this graph i added the adult mosquito survey we did the survey using a sticky of a trap. So uh, from this one, because of um, the MCO, uh, min uh, minimal um, MCO is minimal uh, uh, control order, a uh, minimal movement or movement control order. So what happened is um, we can't do it starting from April or starting from March. So we have to postpone until September when the MCO being uplifted. So what happened is um, after we get the OB traps index and also adopt mosquito survey, and then I put some trend line, it shows that uh, an increasing trends during the cons consecutive cycles. However, we also did the identification of the larvae for each and every of the trap that we are uh, set up and collected from the study site. And then it shows that uh, 
the mean number of larvae decrease uh, uh, decrease compared to the OI and also uh, adult mosquito survey. And okay, when we add the dengue cases into the graph, what happened is uh, it looks something like this. And then I put in the highlight of cycle one, cycle two, and cycle three, just to make sure to 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 highlight to 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 inform you that uh, when is actually the ORS and ADD cover, co coverage. So from this one, what we can see is. It has its own coverage time. So for the EDD and ORS, it's going to be slightly delayed uh, about two weeks to three weeks after the first spray. So if you look at this one, you can see that there is actually a fluctuate of the uh, dengue cases and also um, larvae number and also the, the adult survey. What happened is, okay, when we have this spray one service and and everything all this thing in order and then it shows that when we put it some uh, trend lines okay uh, it shows that uh, there is a possibilities of the dengue cases will be reduced after some times okay so uh, this is what we are we are actually expect hopefully all right and then but this one is not a final data yet so we need to observe for uh, and other other parameters that will be involved, uh, including the uh, pandemic. Okay, now um, randomized control trial is not uh, an easy um, study. Okay, because of its conclude of about two hundred uh, eighty localities, uh, one hundred and forty actually that will be uh, really really needs our um, our. Um, uh, observations. So uh, the challenges is a lot, but I just highlight with uh, to you a few. Okay, you can ask me a questions if you want later. Okay, this is the challenges in conducting the RCT during the pandemic nineteen. So uh, for Malaysian, we know that we have MCO one point until three point Now we are in the MCO three point Hopefully by end of this uh, month, and then that is not. Um, will be extended, but I don't know, based on the recent case. Okay, um, what happened is, uh, when we have the first MCO, um, we are having a problem in doing a, a control study, a control activities, okay? There is a travel restrictions, and then the travel restrictions is actually uh, inter-district. So we have to get a letter, approval letter from the Ministry of Health to conduct the studies. And also the contractors need to get a letter from Ministry of International Trades and Industry. And after we get these letters, then we have to go to the police stations to get a permit for each and every cars that we use for the uh, activities. So for example, for this, uh, um, study, we, we, we have about uh, eight uh, cars operating. So all eight cars must have a very details, uh, uh, details uh, information on the personnel use, their IC number, all those letters is coming from the uh, prominent um, uh, ministries and also the police permit. So, and then this one actually quite a delay because of we need to get all these kinds of things. And then um, after that, uh, we also have a communication limitation between the uh, 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 CE team, uh, EDM CE team with the building managers and head of community. So, uh, Originally, we want to have a face-to-face -face meeting, and then we will have a face-to-face -face, um, uh, talk with the public. However, due to this pandemic, we can't do that. And then all the informations are gone through the uh, online system, like, uh, for example, like uh, video calls, and then um, uh, text messages, email. So they, sometimes this one, the, 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 the information is not, um, they are not really get the whole uh, ideas of what is uh, EDEM all about. So this is the 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 the, the limitations. And then um, in a certain uh, localities, we find out that um, 
uh, they are changes of the building managers. So what happened is we have to go there, we have to contact them and uh, inform them, visit them, and tell them what is, what we are going, uh, what we are doing right now, and then to get their approval. So the second one is limitation in engaging the community in helping us to maintain the water. Okay, based on our study in JB in Johor Bahru, we found out that the water will be deplete. Uh, after six weeks to seven weeks. So basically, we want the the people, the, the community to help us in terms of filling up the water in the ADDs. However, this one is not um, being done properly because of it is very hard to explain to the community how we are going to do these kinds of things. All right, now, because of the, these limitations in the community engagement, it also led to the ADDs misused and mistreated uh, as illegal breeding sites. So they have thrown away the water because of, we are using the pariproxifen. Pari, pariproxifen is not going to kill all the larvae. It's going to uh, retard the growth of the larvae. And then after that, when the pupa stage, they won't be, uh, emerge into pupa and adult and then it will be killed. Okay, so. This is actually that we miss these kinds of information. We did have some like um, a pamphlets, uh, uh, brochures, a, a text message, uh, videos, but that one is not enough because not everybody is actually has the accessibilities to these kinds of um, information. Okay, and then uh, in this picture, there is also that the ADD also become a, a good um, flower pot, you know, because of it design in such a way, right? And then. Um, Okay, when we are working with a group of young men, okay, age of 18 to 25, it is very hard uh, for us to make sure that they uh, do the SOP compliance on the COVID-19. So, for example, uh, how to wear your mask properly, okay, wash your hands, washing your distance, because of this is a young people, then sometimes you have to, you know, uh, get them uh, uh, penalized okay uh, for for not comply to this this uh, this um, uh, rules however after sometimes okay uh, they manage to follow and then uh, they manage to wear the mask properly and then uh, 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 practice their new new norms in in the in the in the everyday activities okay all right um now uh, another one is um, risk of exposure to the COVID-19. So uh, my CE team visited the localities uh, frequently, okay, for giving them all the brochures, you know. But um, we also have the risk of exposure. This is a few, a few times that we have to quarantine ourselves because of we have a very close contact with the uh, community. So uh, I also have the the experience of uh, um, taking. Uh, quarantine myself for 10 days because of a close contact to the positive patient. And then uh, we also do a, a swap test to our all our operators to make sure that, that they are free of the COVID before uh, they return to the, 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 the study sites. Okay, um, in summary, and then my our future plan. Okay, so for the uh, due to the pandemic and enforcement of the MCO in Malaysia, we cannot proceed with the plan for the community engagement and participation. And then we have to modify uh, these parts. And even though the vector control activities can be done as planned, but we have to split into a small team and then this uh, slow down the movement of the operators. Basically, uh, we plan that one day the operators can finish about three localities. However, due to this pandemic and also thus, uh, we have to obey uh, the limitations of the uh, passengers in the vehicle. So, uh, best, uh, the maximum that we can do is actually two localities per day, and it will depend on how big is the localities are. So, for the entomological endpoint, we also need to modify the data uh, that we are collecting indoor. So, uh, we have to modify and then uh, to avoid uh, this, this mod modification is to avoid the direct contact with the community. So, basically, we have to, um, I think, um, Remove the indoor samples collections, right? Um, then, um, but out of this challenge, we also receive a positive feedback from the community. They say that in a certain time they have less mosquito, and then they do not feel um, they, they 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 told us that less mosquito and less uh, feel annoying with the uh, the mosquito 
mosquito flying in the inside their house. So this is a good thing for us. It's a quite quite um, you know, uh, quite impressed with the with the methods. So um, then uh, for the preliminary entomological endpoints here, uh, it is uh, inconsistent. But we saw a decreasing trends in certain parameters and hoping that is going to be uh, decrease more. Okay, these are preliminary, preliminary observations and uh, the final outcome might be different from the data presented in the presentations. Okay, uh, currently we are in the middle of fourth cycle and uh, the first cycle is already started. All right. Um, this, uh, with these slides, I would like to thank to all these people for their approval and support. And then this is my last slide. Uh, back to you, Dr. Nazdi. Uh, thank you, Dr. Husna, for the insightful presentation. It was really interesting. And this shows how much work a researcher has to 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 do in order to get uh, something which is very good for the community to be used in future or for the program managers to be used in future okay we will now be moving to question and answer session please keep sending us your questions and i will be picking few questions to ask from our presenters as you know we have around another 15 minutes left i presume um it looks like we are receiving so many questions now. Oops, there's so many. Okay, my first question from here I will take is, um, you know, this person has sent this question. He's asking, this is for Dr. Rizwan, okay? You have mentioned that a new compound has to go through several processes in drug discovery pathway, such as heat discovery and preclinical stages before it can be approved. What about the natural products? Will it need to go through the same pathway, Dr. Rizwan? Yeah, thank you for the uh, interesting questions. Yes, um, uh, my answer will be yes, because uh, natural products, especially the medicinal plants, uh, actually need to be evaluated further. And um, we need to get uh, more data, efficacy data, safety data, and also um, other data that is needed, uh, especially in the preclinical pre uh, trials, uh, sorry, in preclinical pre parts, where all this data will be uh, used in order for us to actually um, uh, proceed uh, to clinical trials. And then it depends on the um, uh regulatory uh, authorities in each of the country um for our regulatory authority which is npra uh they have set several criteria that need to um be provided before we can actually um register our products uh with with a property claim especially um most of this uh we will get from the preclinical studies. We need to actually perform um, in vitro as well as the in vivo studies as well to actually collect uh, the stability data of the um, compounds or extracts to actually uh, safety data. Efficacy, efficacy data is the one that is most important. Thank you for the question. I hope I, get, I, I have answered the questions well. Uh, Dr. Rizwan? Uh, I would like to ask you, what about the, what you call the products, the herbal products in the markets, which is uh, sold at the counters? Does all those products also go through clinical trials or it's just consumed? You know, sometimes we get so many products in the market up there. <laughs> mm -hmm. I think that is depends on the claims. Um, um, for the natural products to be actually registered uh, to, be, to sell, it depends because in our, uh, for example, reg in our regu regulatory activities, uh, they have set two criteria. One is the uh, one is the product with without claims, and uh, that is a product for traditional uh, based on the traditional use. That will be uh, most commonly uh, natural product that has been in the market today. But uh, for those. Um, with the property claims, uh, there's no, at the moment, there are some, but uh, yes, of course, they have uh, 
need to meet the uh, criteria that has been set. Um, it's quite stringent as actually because it's the quality control of the uh, products and then the, if we're dealing with the uh, plant extract, it needs to be standardized to the compound of interest so that um, the, the efficacy of the product is um, proven. Thank you, Dr. Rizwan. Now I have got uh, questions for Dr. Husna. Looks like we have we are receiving many questions now. So for Dr. Husna, uh, has further investigation being done made for the re den reported dengue cases in the intervention sites to classify whether the cases are actually local or it is imported? That is question one. Maybe you answer this question first, then I will carry on with the next question. Dr. Okay. Husna? Uh, thank you, Dr. Nazdi. Yes, actually, uh, for this one, we uh, the the one that I present in the in the presentation slide just now is actually this just a case. So we are not doing any cleaning cleaning up for the time being. So in the Edengi, we will identify which one is a local, which one is imported. So for this study, we will uh, remove the the one that is uh, imported, and then we will use the local one. And then for for your for your informations for the Edengi uh, for the dengue cases reported and registered in in, in Edengi. Uh, there will be um, uh, uh, investigation uh, conducted by the um, the the district and also the state's health officers. So this one will be um, will be will be um, uh, removed when uh, uh, if it is a uh, import, and then we will adding in if it's a local. So we will do that. So I think um, yeah. I, did, did I did I answer the questions? Yeah, I'm hoping yes. Okay, the next question is, what happened in the intervention sites if outbreak been reported during the uh, study period? Uh, Dr. Husna, did you get my question just now? Uh, not really. So can you? Okay, can I repeat, repeat it. I repeat it. I repeat it one more time. What happens in the intervention sites if outbreak is being reported? Uh, in in the study sites, what happens? Okay. Uh, if the outbreak is uh, it's uh it is reported in the study site, we will do as it is. I mean that ORS and ADD will do as a schedule, and then um the states and the district will share with us with the recent updates on the dengue cases, and then they will also inform us what is actually their uh, activities. So for example, because of uh, MOH SOPs has the if there is a new case, you need to do a space spray, you need to do a lava survey in that particular area. So this one will be reflects in our uh, data analysis later. So all these kinds of information will be shared with the with the research teams. And then uh, based on this one, then we will still proceed as it is. There is no changes at all because of actually OS and ADD is a supporting methods to whatever that we have right now because of uh, when, when we are doing the ORS, actually, we need to uh, have the history of that particular localities. For example, if this area, for example, area A, this area has a, um, a of the, uh, dengue cases every six months, for example, then we can plan the ORS earlier so that we can stop the outbreak or we can stop the uh, increase of the dengue cases. There will be infection, but hopefully that will be a lower. But based on my experience, if we have these kinds of methods earlier, actually you can prevent the outbreak. There will be a case, but only a single or uh, one or two cases, not an outbreak one. And that it's not being uh, continuously for more than a uh, uh, few months. So it will stop at some point. So that is my, my experience. But uh, in the intervention, in, uh, during the outbreak, it will go as 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 a plan. So there will be no stops. Only the 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 the, the, the uh, reports, the detail, the activities that will be shared with us. You don't know. Mm, thank you, Dr. Usna. There is a question for Dr. Rizwan. 
Dr. Rizwan, are, are you hearing me? Yes. Okay. The question is, <clears throat> do you think the immuno, immunomodulatory activity of Karika papaya can be extrapolated onto other viral infection and hypercytokemia? From the evidence that we have, um, it clearly shows that um, it in the dengue virus body, it clearly shows that um, once the, the most infected with dengue virus has been treated with uh, with red cracker papaya leaf juice, um, the number of uh, pro-inflammatory cytokines like IL-6, uh, TNF-alpha, and also others such as um, MCP1 has been shown to be decreased. This is this is uh, one of the good signs um, for um, Karika papaya to be used also in other diseases, which shows a similar uh, kind of um, pro-inflammation activity, some kinds of, especially cytokine storm. I think it's uh, possible. It is possible to, to be used. Uh, thank, you. thank you, Dr. Yeah. Rizwan. Uh, Dr. Husna, there's another question for you. The question is, may I know on the insecticide used for ORS and how was the public response on the implementation of ORS? Okay, uh, uh, for this one, um, uh, sorry, uh, sorry, it was a study, it is up here. Questions. The the question is, Dr. Husna? Dr. Husna, the question is, may I know on the insecticide used for ORS and how was the public response on the impl implementation of ORS? For the ORS, we are using uh, delta metrin at zero uh, at uh, twenty five milligrams per meter square. So this one uh, is a uh, is assisted by the uh, WHO and post, uh, suppliers. And uh, for uh, in the beginning, uh, there's lots of questions okay, uh, from the public, and then they are worried on their safeties. They are worried on uh, how uh, safeties, especially to their children. But uh, yes, uh, for the first cycle, we have a lots of questions, and then we also get um, a lot of feedback also. Uh, and then um, they, are, they are not say that reluctant, but they would like to would like to try because of uh, when I'm working with the outdoor residual spray, what happened is actually it did, it is not only kill the mosquitoes, it also kill um, the one that the pest that inside the house. So uh, some of the public when they see that at the, after a few days we we have this kind of spray, they are like quite happy, especially when they they saw the cockroach is like dying outside the house. They out they out yeah they. Are, going to be um, scream out because of the cockroach but they are happy with it and then they say that it is good so um, basically uh, we have a good uh, uh, feedback from the public and then uh, at a certain area where they have a lots of um, mosquito infestations you know uh, I, I uh, we, we have experience of a few houses where it stays in the top of the of top of the building and then near to the water tank and then there's a lots of mosquito density and then one of the uh, uh, owners call us and they said and they asked us to spray inside the out the house also and then uh, after one week and then she says that okay it's good because of the mosquitoes is reduced and then she can use less um insecticide the household insecticide for example um the aerosols and everything so uh, actually this one is actually encourages to to do more work in in terms of these kinds of things so uh, i do not have any uh, complaint on rejection or not want to have these kinds of methods. Actually, most of them are happy after they, they saw the results on the first cycle. Back to you, Dr. Nancy. Uh, there is one more question for you, Dr. Husna. 
how can we include community more frequently and significantly in surveillance and control of dengue uh, vectors? Okay. Um, well, the, the, the earliest plan for this study is actually we want to uh, engage the uh, head of community and then they have their own groups. Okay, so you uh, in Malaysia, we have actually a uh, groups of um, people like COSPAN. Okay, like uh, uh, what we call as a Rukun Tetangga. I'm not sure what this in English words is. Okay, Kong these people is actually have uh, okay, so so this is actually a group of people that can help us and then engage these kinds of things. I mean, uh, we want to have something like that. And then uh, I think uh, we did um, in two localities before the MCOs and that in this particular area, uh, they help us with uh, put out, uh, top up the water, you know, taking care of the ADD. And then uh, in these two areas, we, we, we know that actually less Damage and missing more, uh, um, uh, uh, missing ADs. Even the drug AD, ADs is also uh, are, are quite lower in this area. So, um, I mean, uh, for 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 Malaysian community, if they can understand what is actually the purpose of the matters, actually they they would like to help. They they really love to help. So, uh, the best thing is the the. Us as um, um, as the researcher, as the government officer needs to to make sure that they understand, and then I think you will get their, their cooperation actually if they can understand very well what you are doing, and then for their own good sake. Yeah, back to you. Yes, I'm sure community will be. I mean, they would like to. You know, when you go to the community and you show them, ah, uh, this is the mosquito larvae, this is the pupae, this is the life cycle. They are also very eager to assist people. But the problem is the sustainability, I suppose, right? Ah, uh, thank you, Doctor Husna. Yes, yes, correct. Ah, uh, Doctor Rizwan, I have got a question for you. Ah, uh, just the question says, <clears throat> sorry, the question says. Maybe need uh, Dr. Rizwan's opinion if dengue possible to be treated with vaccine or drug. Okay, thank you for the questions. Um, I think um, um, in order for us to actually um, create a drug, sorry, create a number of um, treatment in our in, um, preventions uh, in, from dengue infection. I think it uh, vaccine and drugs serve different purposes, and then um, for vaccines, provided it shows the better efficacy than the one that already mentioned before is the, for example, um, thing vaccia. Um, at the moment, current vaccine is not suitable for all dengue patients for all peoples around the world because of. Um, um, it depends on the situations, whether or not to use uh, vaccine or drugs. And um, just in case, if we have a potent, uh, if we have found a potent uh, dengue uh, anti dengue drugs, uh, it's better to use anti dengue drugs. Uh, it, uh, but for me, um, or for my opinion, we should have a integrated approach in uh, fighting the dengue, starting from the prevention. Uh, vector controls. Um, we should also have a vaccine as well, and of course the drug for to treat the dengue patients. I think that uh, is uh, something that is needed to actually to curb the dengue infection. Thank you. Thanks, Doctor Rizwan. So you see, from now, how intelligent is the virus and the mosquito? It's us, the human, who are always the victim. <laughs> so organism is much more. Uh, cleverer than us. There's one more question for Dr. Husna, but I think she's going to answer these particular questions uh, via email. Uh, I think I, uh, due to the constraint of time, uh, I can't be taking ma many more questions. So, however, you may contact the speaker if you have any burning questions to be answered. We hope that this webinar has shed light on the research conducted at our institute and pave way for future collaborations. Ladies and gentlemen, I would like to thank all participants for their support to make this session a successful one.
Uh, you may subscribe to our National Institute of Health Malaysia your YouTube channel and click for notifications whenever there is a new post. Before I conclude, I would like to announce that we will have the next session of IMR Simio webinar series on the 30th July. So do mark your calendars. It's very interesting. The next one is about allergy. And I'm sure most of us here are allergy to some kind of foods. And the theme for the next week webinar is the tale of the tale of food and drug allergies and evolving concepts and mechanisms. People say a lot of things about allergy, this allergy to that. Let us hear from the expert on the 30th July. We hope you can join us at the next session. Now we have come to the end of the web webinar and I would like to end with this quote by Isaac Newton. Listen carefully. Yeah. What we know is a drop. What we don't know is an ocean. Until then, many thanks from all of us at IMR. Take care and always stay safe as well as happy. Thank you so much.
This is all you need Be your everything And yeah, I'll be your everything Still too soon to feel Please just say it's real More than just a thrill Not just in it for the thrill